Welcome. Today we will provide a basic tutorial of thoracic ultrasonography in the ICU. There are multiple advantages of point-of-care ultrasound, including lack of radiation, immediate interpretation of results, reproducible dynamic imaging, and improved cost-effectiveness. Additionally, multiple studies have demonstrated that thoracic ultrasound is an easily obtainable skill. Today we will provide a brief review of ultrasound basics, identify the indications of thoracic ultrasound in the ICU, and demonstrate the procedure for chest ultrasonography. For our demonstration today, we will be using the Sonosite Export Ultrasound Machine. The ultrasound transducer we will use for our thoracic imaging today is the phased array probe, also commonly referred to as the cardiac probe. The curvilinear probe can also be used for this exam, though the footprint is larger. Additionally, the linear probe can be useful specifically for long ultrasound. Throughout the video today, you may hear us refer to several basic ultrasound terms with respect to echogenicity of different tissues. These include anechoic, hypoechoic, isoechoic, and hyperechoic, as depicted here. The provider should position himself and the ultrasound machine to the patient's right. Typically, the patient will be in the supine position. Correct orientation of the probe and screen are critically important for imaging acquisition. We will highlight the correct positioning of probe marker and screen marker as we move through the exam today. In general, lung ultrasound is always completed with the probe marker pointed towards the patient's head and the screen marker aligned to the left of the ultrasound screen. Focus echocardiography is completed with varying positions of the probe marker depending on the desired view, but the screen marker will remain aligned to the right of the ultrasound screen for all echo views. Here are several indications for the utility of thoracic ultrasound in the ICU. This is by no means an exhaustive list of the clinical uses of thoracic ultrasonography. We will focus on several of these today. We will start the thoracic ultrasound exam with focused echocardiography. Image acquisition typically will begin in the parasternal window with parasternal long axis view first. For the entirety of the focused echo exam, the screen indicator will be positioned in the upper right portion of the screen indicating scanning in the cardiac mode. The probe is held with a pencil grip for all views except for the subcostal four-chamber view. As seen here, the patient is positioned supine, though moving the patient to the left lateral position can aid in image quality. The probe is placed to the left of the patient's sternum at the level of the second intercostal space with the indicator marker pointing towards the patient's right shoulder. The optimal view may be obtained by sliding the probe between the second and fifth intercostal spaces and lateral to the sternum until the image shown here is seen. While obtaining this view, it is helpful to remember the ultrasound beam should run parallel to an imaginary line from the patient's right shoulder to their left hip. The image therefore represents an anatomical cross section through the long axis of the heart with the apical portion on the left of the screen and the base of the heart on the right of the screen. Remember that only subtle movements are needed to improve your view. Seen here is a still shot of the ideal parasternal long axis view. We have labeled the important structures commonly identifiable in this view. The rule of thirds can also be seen here where the right ventricular outflow tract, the left ventricular outflow tract, and the left atrium should each take up roughly one third of the screen. Benefits of the parasternal long axis view include assessment of left ventricular size and function, the left atrial size, identification of pericardial fusion, here are several clips of abnormalities identified in the parasternal long axis view. In this first clip, in the parasternal long axis view, you can see a severely dysfunctional left ventricle. In this clip, you can see in the parasternal long axis view, pericardial effusion. One tip in this view is if you see anechoic fluid anterior to the descending aorta, you know this is pericardial effusion. If you see anechoic fluid posterior or at the level of the descending aorta, this often identifies pleural effusion. In this last clip in the parasternal long axis view, you can see a hyperdynamic left ventricle. This often suggests a septic patient or a patient with hypovolemia. We now move to the parasternal short axis view. The most effective way to transition from the parasternal long axis view to the parasternal short axis view is to rotate the probe 90 degrees clockwise so that the probe marker is now pointing to the patient's left shoulder. The probe should not move from its position on the chest other than a simple 90 degrees clockwise rotation, again seen here. Once the parasternal short axis view is obtained, the provider may then tilt the probe so the ultrasound beam scans from apex 
to the base, bringing into view different imaging planes of the short axis view. Again, this simply is a slight tilt from apex all the way through to the base. The home base of the parasternal short axis view is typically at the midventricular level where the left ventricle, right ventricle, and septum are easily identifiable. Benefits of the parasternal short axis view include a global assessment of LV systolic function, segmental left ventricle wall motion abnormalities, and also identification of the so-called D sign to suggest right ventricle dilatation. And lastly, pericardial fusions may also be well visualized here. Here are several clips of abnormalities identified in the parasternal short axis view. In this first clip, we can see significant left ventricular dysfunction with the identification of a hypokinetic left ventricle. Second clip, we see an example of right ventricular dilatation. The so-called D sign is outlined here. Care must be taken that the view is not taken in an off-axis angle as you can get a false D sign appearance. Now we will move from the parasternal short axis view to the apical four-chamber view. This can be challenging due to repositioning of the probe on the patient's chest and due to the often sub substantial difference in probe positioning required from patient to patient. It is often necessary to place the patient in some degree of leftward rotation, if not fully in the left lateral decubitus position. The probe marker should remain towards the 3 o'clock position. As can be seen here, the probe is moved inferiorly and laterally to the left nipple. Once a portion of the apical window is obtained, tilting the probe to a steep angle, pointing the ultrasound beam back up towards the patient's right shoulder, will allow for a full view of all four chambers. But you may have to rotate slightly clockwise or counterclockwise to bring the RV and LV cavities into a true longitudinal cross-sectional view. The ideal image should include a vertical image of all four cardiac chambers in their entirety with mitral valve and tricuspid valve in view. The septum should be visualized hanging near the center of the screen as seen here. Here you can see a still shot of an apical four-chamber view with visualized structures labeled. The apical four-chamber view offers a tremendous amount of clinical information. On a simple assessment, this view allows comparison of RV size to LV size. This ratio should typically be less than two-thirds of the LV size in a normal individual. Here are several clips of abnormalities identified in the apical four-chamber view. In this first clip, we see left ventricular dysfunction. In this clip, we see pericardial fusion without tamponade physiology. We now move from the apical four-chamber view to the subcostal four-chamber view. From the apical four-chamber view, you can see that we move the probe to a midline position directly inferior to the xiphoid process. Unlike prior echo views, the probe should be flat against the chest and the patient's skin and press firmly down with a hand positioned on top of the probe. The probe marker is pointed toward the patient's left. This maneuver can provide a degree of discomfort and the patient should be warned of this. The clinician should direct the ultrasound beam inferior to the sternum and point towards the direction of the heart. Subtle tilting of the ultrasound probe may be needed to acquire an optimal four-chamber view. Here are several clips of abnormalities identified in the apical four-chamber view. In this first clip, we have pericardial effusion identified with right atrial collapse seen. This would suggest tamponade physiology. Care must be taken to make sure that the axis is correct and not foreshortened. We now move from the subcostal four-chamber view to the inferior vena cava view. This is an easy transition as we simply rotate the probe 90 degrees. The probe marker is now pointed cephalab. Holding the probe now with a pencil grip, you may need to rock the probe slightly left to right to bring the IVC into view. A common error when starting out with IVC identification is to mistake the abdominal aorta for the IVC. This mistake can be avoided by scanning along the vessel and visualizing it empty into the right atrium. 
You may also see here the, that the hepatic vein can be seen emptying into the IVC. Lastly, the aorta is pulsatile and has a wall that is thicker and more echogeneic than the IVC. The primary benefit of the IVC view is to aid in assessing the patient's fluid responsiveness by using it as a surrogate for right atrial pressure. Here are two examples of IVC assessment. We now move to lung ultrasound portion of the thoracic exam, where we will briefly demonstrate the use of ultrasound as a diagnostic tool for lung and pleural pathology. Generally speaking, ultrasound waves scatter when confronted with air. Therefore, lung ultrasound is more about interpreting reverberation artifacts in aerated and partially aerated lungs. The exam starts with the patient in the semi-upright position, but may also be done with the patient supine, as seen here. The phased array probe is held with a pencil grip. The two main differences in lung ultrasound as compared to echocardiography are the pro marker and screen marker orientation. The pro marker will be directed cephalad for the entirety of the lung exam. The screen marker will be located on the upper left hand portion of the screen. You can see in the image here how the probe positioning on the chest translates to the image on the screen. Lung ultrasound is conducted by examining one hemithorax at a time and checking three lung zones per side, the upper anterior, the lower anterior, and the posterior lateral. First, we will start with the left hemithorax near the second or third intercostal space at the midclavicular line. Again, the probe marker is oriented cephalad. Here you can see the superior and inferior rib. The space between is considered a window into the pleural and lung parenchyma. In this view, you can identify the presence or absence of lung sliding as well as observe one or two common pleural artifacts. These pleural artifacts are called A-lines and B-lines. Noting the predominant pattern of these artifacts as you complete the rest of your scan through the lungs can be a useful diagnostic tool. Examples of each are shown here. First, A-lines are horizontal hyperechoic artifact lines that are equidistant from the pleura. They are commonly seen in normal lung, COPD, asthma, or pneumothorax. However, in pneumothorax there will be an absence of lung sliding, which we will explain in a minute. B-lines are vertical hyperechoic lines that emanate out from the pleura and extend to the edge of the ultrasound field. They resemble the picture of headlights through fog and may also be referred to as comet tails. To be considered pathologic, there must be three B-lines per rib interspace, as noted here. Acute B-line presence represents fluid accumulation in the interstitial space, suggesting pulmonary edema, hemorrhage, or inflammation. While still in this view, we will briefly touch on the identification of lung sliding. Lung sliding is the shimmering effect seen here that denotes the movement of visceral and parietal pleura during respiration. Its presence indicates an intact pleura interface and therefore absence of any pneumothorax in the current field of view. By utilizing M-mode, we can also confirm the presence or absence of lung sliding. As seen in this example, we select M-mode and orient the ultrasound beam through the middle of the pleura. One of two patterns will be identified. Seen here, the seashore sign is a normal finding sug suggesting that lung sliding is present. As seen in this clip, the barcode or stratosphere sign suggests a pneumothorax or absence of lung sliding. For this demonstration, we will move to the posterior lateral view next. To obtain this view, the clinician should drop his hand to the bed sheet so that the probe is on the lateral posterior portion of the chest. The probe marker remains cephalad with the ultrasound beam angled upwards towards the sky. This allows for additional imaging of the posterior diaphragm and identification of pleural fluid. You may also move up one or two rib spaces or down one or two rib spaces until you identify the diaphragm. This view also provides the ability to identify areas of consolidation or hepatization of the lung. Seen here is an example of a simple pleural effusion with an anechoic space of fluid. In this clip, you can see consolidation or hepatization of the lung. This can suggest atelectasis or pneumonia. It is often required that several rib spaces are checked in each lung zone by simply moving the probe marker along the chest in a cephalad or caudal position. You may now replicate the same maneuver on the right chest. We have now completed the thoracic ultrasound exam. For the purposes of this educational video, we have broken down portions of the exam to highlight the methodical manner in which the clinician can move through this exam. In real practice, this exam can easily be completed in a matter of minutes.
and provide a significant amount of diagnostic utility.